Okay, thanks all for joining and welcome to my uh, talk here at PyData about uh, AsyncIO. I'll be explaining a bit the gist of asynchronous programming in general and show you how to do it in, uh, in Python with uh, package asyncIO. <coughs> right, first a uh, small introduction. Uh, my name is Niels Denissen. I'm a, a data engineer and a bit of a data scientist at the ING Holsel Banking Advanced Analytics team. I worked here for one and a half years now. Before that, finished my master at the University of Utrecht and uh, artificial intelligence, and I did a bachelor in computer science in Eindhoven before that. Okay, at the end of this session, um, you will understand the fundamentals of asynchronous programming. So when, will you, when do you want to use it? So when do you think it will speed up your program? Uh, how you're able to, uh, you'll be able to write your synchronous code into asynchronous code. And finally, if we go really fast, you'll be able to uh, know how to circumvent some typical pitfalls. As I've used the async IO package, welcome everybody. <laughs> uh, I figured out some, uh, um, some tips and tricks and uh, if we get to it, I will explain them as well. Otherwise, you'll find them on GitHub because all of these slides are there as well. Okay, so why did we, ah, Makes a big difference. So why did we actually uh, start looking into AsyncIO? Uh, we had a very small, well, this is a simplified version of it, but we had a very small WebSocket server which was receiving data from multiple clients, and we were writing that to a database and to Kafka. Now, initially, of course, uh, we started by writing this in a, in a synchronous way, and I've tried to visualize this in an execution thread that you see on the right here. So let's say uh, you first receive your data. This is a small orange blob that maybe parses it or does something to your data, and then starts writing it to a database. Now you'll see a gap here, which represents the wait time that you need for writing something to a database. Because you have to send the data over the wire and it will take some time before the database will tell you, I'm done writing. Now after the database is done, you'll start a send to Kafka. And also uh, you have to wait for this IO to happen. So there's again a small wait blob and then uh, Kafka will be done and you can finish off your program. Now, if you, do, uh, if you get a lot of messages in real time, you'll do this multiple times after each other. You can already see that there's a couple of gaps in there that we might be able to improve upon. And that's exactly what uh, asynchronous code does. So using asynchronous code, um, you're able to actually leverage this, uh, this gap of wait time. Mostly that's for IO, but it can be any time of waiting in your program. Um, to, to start, message, start processing other messages. So when you get your first message, you have to wait for the database to return, but you can already start processing the second message that you got. And we'll see later on how that actually happens. Now, a third way of doing this might be uh, multi-threading, but that's a bit of a separate example because technically you could also use asynchronous code in multiple threads. So we'll see multi-threading to uh, have a small comparison between asynchronous code, uh, but officially you can uh, the best, exam best comparison is between synchronous and asynchronous code. Okay, so why would you want to do this? Well, hopefully with the pictures you saw in the previous slide, you already get a bit of an idea of why you would want to use this. You'll use your, your threads more efficiently. You won't have to wait for I.O. to happen. And to make that a bit a little bit stronger, uh, you'll see here a graph of times it took to load uh, Markplatz descriptions into a database. We'll see this example later on, so I'll, I'll dive into this a bit more uh, when we get to that. But on the left-hand side, you'll see the times this took in a synchronous version of the code, a synchronous version of the code, and to have a bit of a comparison, also uh, two threads, four threads, and eight threads. Roughly speaking, the asynchronous version is three to four times uh, faster than the synchronous version, making it equally fast to four threads, roughly. But we'll get to that later on. So how does this actually work? First, a small uh, introduction into uh, asynchronous code in general. So not necessarily yet in Python, uh, but in general. How would you write this? So a normal asynchronous program uh, has a loop. This loop is actually used to uh, maintain all of the tasks that you assign to this loop. So you can assign tasks to this loop, and the loop will tell a task you can start executing now, and a task may at a certain point tell, okay, I have to wait for I.O., so I'll wait, uh, uh, you, can, you can execute something else. So what you typically start with, you initialize the loop, and you tell the loop, you will start working on task A somewhere in the future. Still preparation. You can give it another task, and you can give it as many tasks as you like. So let's do the example with two tasks now. You have task A and task B. 
Well, after you did this initialization of the loop, uh, you can start running it. And the loop will check, okay, first task that I got was task A, so let's give the uh, control of execution uh, to task A. So task A can start executing. Now, task A starts doing its work. In our example, that could be, for instance, receiving a message from the WebSocket server, um, doing some parsing on it. At a certain point, task A will say, okay, I'm now going to write this to the database, and I have to wait for a little while. So it initiates the write call to the database, and then tells AsyncIO, AsyncIO in a later stage, but it tells the loop to, I'm, um, I'm done with the processing that I want to do now. I have to wait for the database to get back to me. So if you want, you can do anything else in between. And the loop will get back this uh, await statement that we'll see in the, in the Python version later on. And the loop will say, okay, now then the next task can start executing. So it gives the execution control to task B. Task B in this example will do exactly the same thing. It will receive a new message. And whenever it goes to a database call or any form of IO, it will give back the control to the loop again. And this process just goes on infinitely or as long as you specify the loop to run. You can tell the loop uh, to finish whenever you would like to. Now, if uh, task A in this example, for instance, get the, gets its data back halfway through task B is executing, then task A, of course, has to wait a little longer, which would make, could make it more inefficient. But in the end, you're using your uh, execution thread more efficiently this way. All right. Key things to remember from this uh, first part. So you have to make sure all of your tasks are programmed asynchronously. Now, shortly get back to this. Say that task A wouldn't be programmed asynchronously. Uh, this await keyword would never be used by task A. So basically the loop would tell task A to start executing. And if task A is a synchronous uh, program, task A will just hog all the resources and keep on executing. Will never tell the loop to get back to do some, doing something else. So you don't want to have synchronous tasks in your asynchronous program. First important thing is all your tasks have to be asynchronous that you want to use in your asynchronous program. Uh, secondly, we saw that already. Uh, you have to create an event loop. The event loop will uh, control stuff for you, will maintain the execution thread for all your tasks. You have to assign these tasks to the event loop. And finally, you have to run the event loop and tell it when to stop. Okay, enough of the theory. Let's look at some code. So we'll start with a simple uh, synchronous example of a PyData talk. You'll see that it will start with printing welcome and then has some sleep period in there. That's to simulate any kind of IO operation or wait operation that you'd have to do in the code. Question mark, sleep, profit, and hopefully it will return knowledge. Yeah, so we can see that actually does it. Now, how do we write this asynchronously, this small example program. Uh, for that, we need two things. Uh, in Python, you have two keywords that uh, support this. Uh, ever since 3.5, it's the async and the await keyword. Before that, maybe some of you looked at it as well, uh, you had the async.io.coroutine keyword and the yield from. But now we have this async and await. Async tells Python that this function will be an asynchronous function, and await will tell the, the uh, interpreter at this point in time uh, I can give back control to the loop. So we saw that in the visualization a bit already. Now let's rewrite this uh, pydata talk function to its uh, asynchronous version. Okay. Well, first of all, for that, we need async.io. Should make sense. As we saw before, we have to tell uh, Python that this will be an asynchronous uh, program, asynchronous function. So we put async there. And at every point in time where we want to give back control to the loop, all of these sleep statements, we're not doing anything, we're just waiting. So we want to give back control to the loop and we tell it by putting a wait there. Now, if I run this and we look at the next point in time, what do you think will happen when we call this function? Anybody an ID? Well, let's just call it. Yes. <laughs> So maybe you thought uh, this would print uh, welcome, question mark, profit, and return knowledge. Uh, but it doesn't do that. It actually gives you a coroutine object. That's because we put the async keyword there, which doesn't make it, a f well, it technically still is a function, but it's not a function you can call directly anymore. It's just a function that you give to a loop object. So the loop can actually run this object. So remember, we had uh, two or three uh, tasks left to do. We rewrote this program to its asynchronous version. 
but we still have to create a loop object. Let's do that here. So we'll need async IO, and we can get the event loop this way. This will create a, a loop object in async IO. We'll have to assign the tasks to the, uh, to the loop. We can do that using create task. And let's say we want to run this pydata talk function here with a sleep of one second. And this create task object will have you actually give you back a task object that you can later use to uh, check if this task is completed. So we'll catch the, the object that gets back, task A, and then we finally have to run the loop. Okay. How do we do this? Well, we can use uh, multiple versions. We'll see run forever later on as well. But one of the ways to do this is to use run until complete. We can say run this until task A completes. So we'll run as long as this task finishes. So let's see what this does. It starts printing welcome, and then immediately gives us a type error. Now, why is that? So let's see what it says. It says object non-type can be used uh, in an await expression. The function that we use on top here, time.sleep, it doesn't actually give you back an awaitable object. So this time.sleep function isn't capable of uh, executing asynchronously. So that's what step one in our program. We have to make sure everything runs asynchronously. Everything has to be capable of giving this control back to the loop. So unfortunately, we cannot use uh, time.sleep, but fortunately, async.io has a sleep function as well that is able to do this. So let's see what happens if we run this again. Luckily, we'll <laughs> get our regular program back. Welcome, question mark, profit, and we'll return knowledge. Now, this is not so interesting yet, maybe, because we have one task. So this task will give back control to the loop. The loop will just wait as long until this task can execute again because there's nothing else to do. So you cannot actually uh, leverage the wait times yet. For that, we need a second task. So let's create a second asynchronous task. Let's say I would like to drink water during giving my PyData talk. And uh, this function will just print first sip, second sip, and in between it will again do a, an async IO uh, sleep. Just wait a bit. Uh, if I drink too much, I might have to go to the bathroom. So let's see what happens if we run this. Uh, as you can see, I create uh, two task objects again, catch them in a, in a function, and I will run until complete this task drink function. What you'll see now is that this loop object actually started giving control to the task that was ready to execute something. So first it starts with printing welcome, which was the pydata talk function that we saw. Uh, the pydata talk function will at that point in time say, okay, I'm done executing, I have an await statement now, the loop can start something else, and the loop gave uh, the execution thread uh, to the drink water function and first sip will be printed. Now, what you may have noticed is that we haven't yet gotten any profit out of this talk, and we didn't get uh, knowledge back yet. So how do we actually do this, and why is that? That is because um, we have this run until complete, only until task drink completes. So the loop will say, whenever I get a return statement from task drink, I will return this. It's what you see, bathroom break being returned, and I'll stop. And we can actually see that. If we run the loop uh, again until task talk completes, that there's the, our leftover uh, parts of the program. So you have to make sure that you run this loop until all the tasks are finished. And you can do this in a, in a more proper way by using async.io.gather. This will actually gather the two uh, futures, the two tasks, into a single task that you can await and make sure that both of these are finished. So if we run this, we'll see that it again interleaves operations of the two tasks and finally returns a list of both return statements, knowledge and bathroom break, because we gave it in that order. So it's a way of properly executing uh, multiple tasks using async.io. We'll see a small uh, example if we have time of doing this uh, in a yet another way. Okay. So now we, do, we saw some code, and let's uh, revert back to what we've, uh, what we've seen. Uh, key things to remember from this, uh, again, program your task asynchronously with the time.sleep. We saw it doesn't work if you have a synchronous version of a program in there. Uh, use the async and await keywords for that. 
secondly, create an event loop, async IO to get event loop. Third, give these tasks to the event loop, tell it to start executing this in the future and actually run the loop. And make sure you run until complete all of the tasks that you want to complete. Yeah. I'm a bit unclear about the, the keywords. Uh, async, uh, a wait, what was it? Wait, and the other one, async. Yeah. And the async IO library, I presume. Is yeah. It, why? Why do you need? So the, I, what I understood from it is async IO started with this uh, syntax of using async and await, but it actually got adopted by uh, Python later on. So the async and await keywords are not strictly bound to async IO anymore. It's a separate, uh, well way of writing functions in Python. So you don't have to use async.io at all. You can even write your own loop, your own event loop. I think Curio is another version of, a, of an asynchronous loop okay. uh, that also uses async and await keywords. But async.io, for instance, in this case, provides you with a sleep object and this loop object. Okay. And that's the, the official adopted way by Python now, but there's multiple ways you can write your own. If you want to uh, want to see uh, another version of it on uh, GitHub uh, at the end of this presentation, I don't think I'll get to that. There's a small example of writing your own loop, okay. if you'd like to. So uh, we saw a nice toy example now. Uh, hopefully, got you a little bit of how this asyncio library works. But uh, this is not a very realistic example. So let's see uh, what realistic example we can actually do with asyncio. What we're going to do is we're going to scrape pages from Marktplatz. Marktplatz is the Dutch version of eBay. Basically, you can buy secondhand stuff from people there. And show you how it looks. For instance, in our example here, we're going to look for motorcycle stuff, anything that's posted on motorcycles. And what our program hopefully will do is we'll go to any page of a motorcycle and then read its description because we'd like to know what words, words are used most by people who try to sell their motorcycle. So that's the use case of this, uh, this example. Uh, a bit too fast. Um, I'll go through this uh, a bit globally. I really don't, don't want to dive into every bit of code precisely, but hopefully you'll get the gist of it. Uh, we'll use the request library here and beautiful soup to parse uh, HTML pages. I have a small function here to get the soup <laughs> from beautiful soup out of a, a requested HTML page. What you'll see here is we actually uh, read in this article page. So it's one big page and then start reading the subsequent uh, posts, the article posts in Markplatz and get the description out of it. And we're gonna write that to a database later on. So this is a small generator that will, every time you call it, generate one new description from Markplatz. You can see that happening if my Wi-Fi is connected. Yeah. Well, this is a very persuasive ad with all caps locks. Uh, but if we go through this generator, we'll just get a lot of this, uh, these descriptions from Mark Platz. Now, that's the synchronous version of your generator. And you can use this to write a synchronous version of your program. So what this program will do is it will uh, initiate the generator run through it, so in write everything here, for instance, it will run through all of the pages in Markplatz that you want to run through, and finally do a uh, psychopg uh, write. So in this write function here, we will just simply insert this uh, description into our database. That's all. So we're reading from Markplatz and writing to our database. That's the synchronous version. Um, we can also do this in a multi-threaded way. Multi-threaded is really easy. We just start the number of threads that you specify and we uh, run a synchronous version of the program in each of the threads. So that's uh, multi-threaded in a synchronous way. And finally, of course, we have an asynchronous way. I'll dive into this a little bit more. Uh, we saw that we had a, a synchronous generated before with the request library. Now, if you wanna write an asynchronous version of this, uh, remember that you have to write your program asynchronously. So every part of your program has to be asynchronous. Now, requests doesn't have the capability of uh, using the await keyword, so we need another library, in this case, AIO HTTP, which is able to use the await keyword and actually can give back control to the loop. This is an IO operation, so we need a separate library for that. So we use that. 
to rewrite the generator in an asynchronous way. Note that here again, I use the async keyword to specify uh, this is an asynchronous function and the await uh, statements whenever necessary if I do a, day, a call to this HTTP uh, address. Now the asynchronous class itself uh, is actually doing uh, calls to the database. And again, we are writing to a database. We used Psycop G2 uh, before in the synchronous version. Again, we need another library that is able, uh, capable of uh, giving back control to the loop. Uh, in this case, I use async PG. We have a couple for Postgres writes and for other databases. And you'll see here there's a small uh, alteration. When I write everything, I have to create a task for every page I would like to write. So I'm using list comprehension. I create a num number of tasks for every separate page, and I write this to a database. Run until complete, again, asyncio.gather, until all of these tasks complete. Now, let's see what this gives us. Small speed comparison, and actually that's the graph that you saw in the beginning. <laughs> the asynchronous version of this program, uh, roughly four times as fast, it can leverage all of the uh, wait times you need for calling uh, Markplatz pages. So AIO HTTP gives you this uh, benefit. And with async PG, you can actually speed up your database writes. Uh, in this case, for instance, if we're writing 100 pages to Markplatz, you can do this a number of different ways. You could spin up uh, five tasks and give them each 20 pages. Uh, what I did now is make a task for every separate page that we write. So one page contains multiple articles. So if I'm writing 100 uh, pages to, uh, from Mark Platz in my database, I start 100 asynchronous tasks that each will start with doing a request to Mark Platz. The first one will say, okay, I'm now waiting for Mark Platz. Second one will start executing and so on. Now, if you wanna look at it a bit more in depth, uh, this is just a different uh, visualization of the same, uh, same data, but now over time. So on the x-axis, you'll see the articles that have been written. So the more articles you're gonna write, this scales linearly, the time it took to write these articles. Now we had a, a problem, so we'd also like to see the solution of that. Of course, the engineering part of this is way more interesting, but <laughs> a result of this is uh, our, onze apparently is the most used word to try to sell your motorcycle. Motor is kind of obvious, parts, couple of words that are interesting. Now I have quite some time left, so I'll uh, also walk through some uh, learnings that I've saw, uh, seen in practice. Um, first of all, there's uh, exception handling. So we saw writing a, an asynchronous uh, program, you need a loop object, but handling exceptions is very uncommon. We'll see that now. Passing data between tasks, you may wanna do that and control your tasks. So there's a couple of uh, timeout features that you can use there. I'll see how far I get. Exception handling. So say that we have a, a small asynchronous function. Please accept me. That will first uh, print, wait for it. Then it will wait for a little while so that you can actually see that it's doing something. And right after it prints incoming, we expect an exception to happen. Now, let's see what this does. If we run it, we see, wait for it, incoming, exception. That's exactly how we would expect it to happen. Now, why uh, does it work here? Uh, that's because when you run until complete, the result of your asynchronous function, so in this case, the result of my please accept function will be evaluated by run until complete to return it uh, in this function. So you'll see that the return statement Normally we saw that the uh, pydata talk function, for instance, returned knowledge. So we actually got our return statement right after we ran until complete. Here we also evaluate the result, which is an exception. So this case is still fine. But what if we look at a different case? If we wanna run something indefinitely. So we saw in the beginning a WebSocket server example. This WebSocket server, of course, runs indefinitely, so you'll be waiting for messages coming in all the time, writing to the database as you get them, and writing to Kafka as you get them as well. So I added a small uh, while through loop here that will just infinitely run this talk. I believe it's recorded, so you can actually do that if you want. We need a stopper, because if we run a task uh, infinitely, we'll never be able to get back control, so I 
uh, added a small stop function that is uh, just waits for the specified amount of time and then stops the loop. So you give the loop object to it, and using stop, you can make it stop. Now let's see what we what happens when we run it here. So <clears throat> as you'll see I'll create uh, three tasks. One task uh, is the PyData data task uh, task that we just saw. It's an infinite running talk. Second one is our uh, accept me, which will uh, give an exception after two seconds, hopefully. And the fourth task is our uh, the third task is our stopper, which will wait four seconds and then stop the loop. Now, normally, uh, you would expect an exception after two seconds, but let's see what happens. Yeah. So we saw that uh, immediately after incoming in the previous version of the program, we got an exception, and the program failed as you would expect it to fail. But now we didn't get the exception. How come? Well. We saw in the, in, the, in the previous one that we were using run until complete, the uh, result of this uh, task is being evaluated immediately after the run until complete to see what's in, what's in there. And at that point in time, the exception is thrown because the loop realizes that there's an exception there. In this case, we're running forever, and the loop will never evaluate the result of task accept, even though the task accept task is completed. So you'll not get the exception. And in the beginning, this is very annoying when you're uh, using async IO. You have no idea what's going on. You expect an exception, but it's not there. So how can you circumvent this? Oh, yeah. Actually, to show you that this exception is there still, when you get the result of this task accept task right after this, you'll see the exception is still in there. Now, to circumvent this, uh, you can specify an exception handler and give that to uh, the loop object. And the loop object will use this exception handler to uh, execute whenever it finds an exception in any of the tasks. So what we do here is we specify an exception handler and give it a loop object. Loop object is the async IO loop itself. And the context, the context will be filled by what the context of the exception is. We will stop the loop object, because normally that's what you would like to happen when an exception occurs. Just stop the program and print the exception. And we set the exception handler here. So if we create this task, uh, I didn't uh, reset the loop. So the infinite by data talk function is still in there. You'll see that that one starts printing along with the wait for it incoming function. But now, actually, the exception is not thrown in a nice way yet, but it at least is caught, the loop is stopped, and you can print the exception and handle, handle accordingly. Now, one thing I uh, figured out, which can also cause some headaches, uh, it's not really a solution to it yet, but uh, you may have noticed that in the previous, uh, in this example here, I didn't actually catch the task object. So I started loop.createTask, but I didn't assign it to a new variable. Um, of course, when you run that, when you loop that run forever, you will this will loop uh, this will run forever. So you won't need to catch this task object. But say that you would do it anyway. That's the version here. Uh, go back one. That's the version you see here. We actually get the task object, and we try to do the exact same thing. So this loop object still has the exception handler. Let's see what happens if we run this one forever. Now, uh, no exception is thrown anymore. Very weird, because we just specified the exception handler. I also don't know if I have the answer to it, but I'd like to uh, note this at least. Uh, there's a, uh, you would expect uh, the exception handler to catch this. There's some guys who are uh, talking about this. Uh, I think it's still a bug. Basically, what, hap what they think happens is the, the task is never garbage collected and it might do some tricky stuff. I'll leave it with that, but at least note that if you actually catch the task object when running it until complete, running it forever, this might mess up your uh, exceptions anyway. All right. Small extra, st extra task. Uh, if you want to pass data between tasks, so Normally what you can do is you can write a task for every complete program. So if you want to receive messages from a WebSocket server, send them to the database and send them to Kafka. You can do this in one program using await statements. But what you could also do is split up the program in receiving from WebSockets, putting that in a queue. 
That's what a queue is very useful for, and you have an asynchronous version of a queue. Uh, then let the database handler pick up from that queue and send to the database, and let the Kafka handler pick up and send to Kafka. And we found that that's a very nice way of passing objects in between tasks. So here I'll have a small adder, which will uh, loop over a range of zero until five, range six, put them in the queue, and sleep for a uh, hundred of a second, and the reader, which will take from this queue. And you see that this queue object, I'll uh, create in a later stage, this is again an async IO function. Uh, it supports the await keywords, which makes sure that the control is given back to the loop immediately after you put it in the, in the queue. So if we run this, we'll see here that we start a new version of the loop. I'm running all of this in one Python notebook, so it can get a bit messy with loops. So I create a new uh, loop object and I set async.io to use this new loop object. I create an asynchronous queue and we, we uh, create two readers and one adder. The adder will start adding tasks to the loop and the readers will process them as necessary. Finally, we'll close the loop. Now, as you can see, reader number one reads the first message, number zero. Reader number two will pick up on the on the second one, number one, and so on. And in this case, you can actually see that the loop gives back control of gives control to uh, one function in a well in a ordered way. First, the adder will be given control, who adds something to the queue. First, reader will be given control. Then nothing else can happen, so the adder will get back control. We'll add it to the loop. And the loop now thinks, okay, let's give control to the second reader and We'll do it in a fair way. So you see this reads one, two, three, four, five. Okay, looking at time, I think I can shortly explain you how to control tasks. Um, we saw the asyncio.gather uh, way of controlling tasks, which you can, uh, with which you can combine two tasks into one task and await them. Uh, there's a second way of doing it, and that's using asyncio.wait. And it gives you a little bit more functionality to, for instance, specify a timeout. When one of the tasks times out, you would want to uh, stop executing. And if we use this one, note here that the timeout I give it is one second, and the task will actually sleep for two seconds. You'll see that if I run this, uh, asyncio will give me back. There's still a task running in your loop, but see what you do with it. And if I try to get the result of that task, well, Result is not ready yet. Now there's a couple more uh, small features in uh, in there in the uh, wait. You can also await up until the first uh, task completes. Not execute this now, given time. And there's another one uh, which will stop until an exception occurs. All right. I hope you've gained some knowledge on how to do asynchronous programming in Python using async.io. If you'd like to see more of it, there's a, a bit more extra references uh, after this talk. For instance, how does async.io work under the hood? Not in very much detail, but a bit more than, uh, than I've given now. Uh, you can find it on GitHub on my uh, page. Thanks for listening. Uh, please. Thank you.